I've got to think, since it's an open letter like this, that it's not just for Titus and his role as an evangelist, but it's for the church at, at large to appreciate, support, understand uh, what what elders are supposed to be doing, because he addresses elders, but specifically what an evangelist is supposed to be doing, and to uh, 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 jump on board with whatever uh, part of the body, whatever role you're supposed to play. He, he has some introductory remarks, makes a comment about him leaving Titus behind and telling him several things he's supposed to do. The first section deals with uh, uh, the appointment of elders, and we have a long list of qualifications there. And the basic idea when we reviewed this was good reputation, good godly spiritual reputation. These are the, these are the uh, men in the church that not only are given the responsibility to oversee but they're also the men who are supposed to be setting the standard so, so that uh, we can tell our kids, hey, look at that. That's the kind of person you're supposed to be. Well, he goes from talking about elders, and there's, there's some other things in there, and he specifically talks about some warnings. He, he, that's sprinkled throughout the entire book of Titus. says you've got to be careful for people who, who, who try to disrupt what God wants done by being divisive and teaching things that shouldn't be taught. Well, he talks about eldership first, and then he goes about, in chapter 2, and he talks about to make sure that you instruct the older men. And the basic idea behind instructing the older men is, again, having a good reputation. Then he talks about instructing the older women, and uh, uh, he really focuses a lot on what comes out of the mouth when he deals with women, which I find very interesting. Uh, somewhere I've heard that women talk about two and a half times as much as men do. So maybe, maybe a little extra warning is needed there. I don't know. Um, but then he skips younger women and goes and talks about younger men. The reason he skips younger women as far as his responsibility is because that was put underneath the responsibility of the older women. Remember that? So as he's going through these, uh, I know we're down around verse 9, but I want to go back to verse 1 real quickly and just make one point. Chapter 2, verse 1, you, however, must teach. The must here, uh, several times throughout this chapter, you might see the word must. That's good if your translation says that because these are imperatives, and he's carrying these imperatives throughout. The reason I want to remind you, remind us all of this, is he's going to get a little bit later. He's going to make a summary remark, and he's going to come back to all these musts. Okay, so please keep in the back of your mind, not just eldership, but older men, older women, younger women, younger men, we, we all have to be concerned about uh, the way we're living for God, right? Then he goes, after, after talking about older men, older women, younger women, younger men, verse 9 is where he makes a shift in talking about slaves. Okay, just to refresh our memory, when we're talking about slaves, what would be the parallel to slavery today? Boy. Yes. Um, I, I, having said that, I, I very much agree with that, although that's only one slice of the pie. Uh, slavery uh, also included something that was horrendous, but it was very broad. It would, it would be like employer-employee employer relationships would be underneath that umbrella, yes? Right. I was just talking to somebody about this, actually. Good. And so the, the, the slavery that's horrendous, of course, the Christian wouldn't want that because that's against God's will. Yes. So they would probably release them? <clears throat> okay. Um, I, I think uh, under certain circumstances, I think that's true. I think they would. Um, but that's the very question I wanted to ask as we start because this is kind of where we left off last week. If this does include horrendous things, which we have a lot of historical uh, uh, information that, that tells us there were a lot of atrocities in slavery. If that's the case, then why doesn't the Bible specifically say, by the way, this kind of slavery, it's a no-go. Why doesn't the Bible do that? Because Christians have transformed minds because of the Bible, the rest of the Bible, and the rest of God's Word. Okay, okay, okay. Um, if, if I could interpret that, <laughs> I, I, I agree with you, and the way I would apply that to here is there's a sense in which you could say the Bible did address it, mm -hmm. right? Because it tells us we're supposed to be a certain kind of people. 
And it also tells us how we're supposed to act towards one another. So there's a sense in which the Bible did address that kind of slavery. We shouldn't be involved in that kind of thing. doesn't have to specifically mention it because it's already told us about the way we're supposed to relate with other people. So I don't know if that's exactly what you're getting at or not, but, but I agree with that. But it, this has, I think I mentioned this last week, this has bothered people a lot. Uh, especially in the last hundred years or so, um, why didn't Jesus come out? Why didn't anybody in the New Testament come out and just condemn slavery and say, this is a terrible thing, we need to get rid of it? Great. Right. opinion, I, I wonder whether or not the slavery in and of itself was necessarily the problem as much as how you treat your slaves or how people are treated. Again, as Christians, we're told how to treat people. Well, if you're treating them the way you're supposed to as a Christian, is it... I don't know whether God was necessarily condemning the fact that somebody might have owned somebody else. There's slavery throughout history going way back to Genesis, I think. So, Well, is anybody ever that. really free? No, well, there's that. <laughs> you're right. We're all, we're all slaves. According to the Book of Romans, the only freedom we really have it's freedom to choose who we're going to be a slave to. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, can, can we agree on the fact that slavery is a terrible thing? Well, maybe not. I'm, I'm here to say slavery is terrible. Yeah. <laughs> what you got? <laughs> <laughs> what kind of guys are you? <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't God come out and directly and tell the slaves to obey their masters? And so, therefore, you think he would not be against it, but he would be against treating them poorly. Very much so. Uh, another very good point. We are going to read some verses in just a second here where he talks about how to be a good slave. That's exactly right. It, it, by the way, it does make sense that there would be more attention given to this just by the statistics. You're going to have a whole lot more slaves than you're going to have slave owners. And so uh, as far as who you direct this to? For the most part, weren't they were treated very well and, and given benefits and all that? And oh, okay, I'm so not so sure I use the word for the most part, but there were slave conditions, and slavery was such a big thing. Quite a few slaves. Yeah, I would agree with that. There was nothing wrong with that kind of relationship. It was very much like employer employee, and most most people, if you if you say, why doesn't the Bible? Talk against employer-employee relationship. Well, you can't have you can't have life without that. You can't function without that. Uh, it does talk about abuses, as far as you know. If you deal with the principle, you cover a whole bunch of different specific situations. So you deal with the principle about how to treat one another. I think we're on the same page with that, right? So the the way we ought to treat one another, there shouldn't be the kind of abuses involved in slavery. Having said that. A lot of people still think, yeah, but you know, why didn't, why didn't God come out and condemn slavery? Okay, push pause for just a second. Let me, let me bring something else up. Isn't, isn't, dic isn't a dictatorship or communism, fascism, aren't some of those things atrocious? Haven't, haven't a lot of people lost their lives? Haven't there been terrible things? Do you, re do you realize what kind of uh, leader that Caesar was over the Roman Empire? Do you know, do you know what kind of atrocities took place, especially to Christians? Okay, well, if we want to ask, ask that question about slavery, why don't we ask the question of, hey, why does the Bible take a little stronger stand on some of these political things? Because aren't those terrible? And I'm shaking my head. Yeah, they're terrible. There's some really bad things. So why didn't the Bible talk about that? Well, again, indirectly, indirectly, and I, I'm, I'm going to go with that. Same, same principle of slavery is the same principle with a lot of uh, political abuses, political abuse, by, it, it does deal with that as far as how we're supposed to deal with people. But the question remains, why not address slavery? Why not address dictatorships, fascism, stuff like that? Yeah. Well, it, it, this reminds me of the, uh, the missionary he talked about where his expectation, well, where he basically found himself in a new situation and said, all right, well, this is my new situation, and so this is how I can work for God, and um, and we know, based on the Bible, too, that the world is going to be a disgusting place 
so long as sin exists. Oh, boy, you make a couple of very, very good points. I'll go in reverse order. This is not heaven here. And it's, you know what? It's impossible for this place to be heaven. Um, um, this, this, this world we live in is a mission field. It's not our home. We're looking forward to that place. It's going to be our home. And the, the, the second point that you, you brought up first, I, I wish I could think of a stronger way to make this point. But I'm, I'm just going to count on the content here. Talking about slavery, talking about dictatorships, talking about persecution, talking about all that stuff. It's as though the Bible doesn't want to get sidetracked on things that important. Because what it's talking about is so much more important. Because what, what difference does it, this is going to sound just so terrible, what difference does it make if you're a slave your whole life but you end up in hell versus heaven? That's what's really important. Eternity versus the abuses that can take place here. Okay, well then we can take that to the poor, to money issues. Um, Jesus even said, you will always have the poor. I, you know, that sounded rather, you know, Careless. Why aren't we trying to stop all poverty? And it's like, well, again, it would go the same route. It would take you away from the mission. It, it doesn't matter whether people are poor or rich or what. Same two steps. It, the Bible does address taking care of people in need. It really does. Just like it does address how you should treat your fellow human being. Just like it does address don't abuse your power and authoritative positions. It, it does address all those things. And it does tell us the right way to live. But it never loses focus of what the most important thing is. The Bible, the Bible doesn't get off track and say, okay, I really want my people to make the world full of democracies, because that's just going to be great. <laughs> well, you know what? I, I think democracies are much more uh, compatible with living a Christian lifestyle and, and things like that happening. But you know what? That's sidetracking from what is just the most important thing. And the illustration that I mentioned uh, last week that, that just resonates with me is if, if I were helping support a missionary to Russia or to uh, North Korea or someplace like that. North Korea, let's pick North Korea. And he came back and he said, you know what? He says, I've been trying so much to overthrow Kim Jong, whatever his guy's name is, because of all the atrocities and everything, I've been spending all this effort, and I've got this underground railroad going and everything else. And then I ask him, and how many people have you baptized? How many people are coming to church? Well, you, you know, this, there's atrocities there, Mark. There's so much going on. I've just got to focus on that. And you know what? I don't want to sound heartless, because there are atrocities. That's terrible. But as bad as that stuff is, that's not as important as eternity. So, so it just puts it in perspective. This whole... This, this, the whole thing of slavery, yes, it's employer-employee. It's also worse than that. But I really do think if we have the Christian mindset, eternal big picture, not just this life big picture, eternal big picture, I think it makes perfect sense that it was be the kind of people God wants us to be. And so when we're involved in situations like that, you know what, we're going to do away with slavery. But that's not our main job. It's not our main focus. In fact, let's listen to the news, the, the, the directions. It says teach slaves. It doesn't say just teach some of the slaves, you know, that are in good condition. No, just a, a broad, broad strokes here. Teach the slaves to be subject to their masters in everything. Okay, there is an assumption made here. Back in Acts, the fourth chapter, remember when Peter and John are told by the Sanhedrin they have to stop talking about Jesus? What do they say when, they, when they're told you no longer preach about Jesus? I mean, this is the Supreme Court of the day. It's the, it's the Jewish leadership. You're supposed to respect authority. And the authority is telling them, don't do it anymore. Just like uh, a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, what, back in the day with the Iron Curtain, they said, we don't want Bibles in here. And you can come visit as a tourist, but you can't talk about Jesus. We went in, we talked about Jesus to the Bibles anyway. We were breaking the law. But there's a higher law, isn't there? That, that's what Acts chapter 4 says. When Peter and John were taken by the Sanhedrin, they were told not to preach. They said, well, you be the judge. If God's telling us to do something, you're telling us to do something, which one do you think we ought to do that? So, so there's, there's, this, there's this understanding that God's standard is always higher. The reason I bring that up is if your boss tells you to do something unethical in God's eyes, 
Are, are you off the hook because, hey, I'm just being a good employee? No, no you're not. You have to answer to God. God's the higher standard. And so, it's, and so this, is not, this is not pushing that aside. It's just saying insofar as what you're supposed to do. Do what you're supposed to do. Look at the way, look at the way he says this. Try, try to please them, not talk back to them. So it's not like uh, being a disgruntled or, or, or always sticking up for your own rights. No, there's something more important than my own rights. Remember how Jesus <laughs> talked about this? If somebody slaps you on the right cheek, what are you supposed to do? Yeah. Why in the world would any self-respecting person do that? Because there's something more important to me. More important than, than my being. You, by the way, you, you do realize right hand, it'd be a backhanded, be a humiliating thing. So somebody humiliates you, uh, disrespects you. Uh, that, that's the idea here. Well, there's something more important than you. Something more important than me. It's representing God. He says, he says here, try to please them, not talk back to them. Verse 10, do not steal from them. Uh, but by the way, this is where I help. I think it helps to put ourselves in an employee position because sometimes employees of responsibility have the opportunity to take some stuff home with them or to you know do stuff like that. And he says, just because you have the opportunity and you can rationalize yourself, company won't miss this. You know they underpay me. You I mean, can rationalize that all day long. And, and and he says, don't do that. Don't take advantage of what you could. Do not steal from them, but show that you can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make the teaching about God our Savior attractive. You get the bottom line here? It, whatever the situation is, whether, whether we feel like we're being abused or not treated fairly or not, you know what? That's not the goal. The goal here is when they look at us, it's kind of like, wow, that, that's a Christian. I, I, want, I want more Christians to work for me. I, I can't tell you the number of times I've heard that story where, uh, where in, in fact, I find it kind of humorous sometimes because I've heard some companies that could care less about Christianity, but they want Christians to work for them because <laughs> they figured out the people who really take it seriously. Wow, those guys are great employees. Um, unfortunately, we don't have, always have that reputation, but, but it seems to me we should based on what he's talking about here. By the way, these are still imperatives. These are things that have to happen for us to accomplish our mission, right? Verse 11, for the grace of God has appeared. What does your translation say there for appeared? Appeared. appeared. Everybody says appeared. I just found this interesting. This is the <coughs> word where we get epiphany. It, it, it's just curious. It, that, that's a good translation, appeared. It, been presented. The grace of God has come on the scenes that offers salvation to all people. Okay, in the context here, even your boss. The people who watch you, everybody. So, we, so we have to be, uh, you know, uh, alert in in living the way God wants us to live. Salvation to all people. It teaches us to say. By the way, this word for teaching literally means training up a child. And and it's it's not a. It, the reason I bring that up is because it's not the idea of okay, read this book, read these verses, and you got it. No, this is this is the kind of teaching of. Okay, we're going to talk about this, we're going to practice it, and then I'm going to show you where you made your mistakes. We're going to do it again, and we're going to practice a little bit more, and we're going to do it again. We're going to practice it. That's life, and then you just have to kind of go through the growing process. And he says it, it, that that's what God does for us. He takes us through the growing process so that we can say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in this present age. This is interesting because when he says self-controlled, that's a word that more... Uh, that more focuses on what happens inside your head, what's going on inside. Upright is more what's going on outside, right? So on the inside, you've got this kind of control, uh, your thoughts, everything else. On the outside, what people see, and then godly lives, what God sees, right? So he's, he's hitting this from every angle. But the thing that's interesting here that's hard to come present in the English, when he says to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives, live is aorist tense. Not present tense, aorist tense. Well, what does aorist tense mean? Ongoing. Present tense is ongoing. Oh, okay. Yeah, perfect is one time with ongoing. Present tense is just ongoing, keep on doing it. Aorist is, boom, it happened. Okay, that's really unusual that he presents this in the aorist tense. The idea is, listen, you have made a life shift. You're not that kind of person anymore. What kind of person are you? I am the kind of person Boom, period. I'm the kind of person who's always thinking about the inside, the outside, and what God thinks. 
see, see the, 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 uh, the emphasis is just a little different when he puts it in the aorist tense here. In verse 13, um, while we wait for this blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior. Oh, did you, did you catch that? The glory of our great Theos, God and Savior Jesus Christ. What did he just call Jesus? God. Oh, put this on that list of all those other verses where Jesus, is Jesus God? Just call him God again. It does it several times in the Bible. Here's another one. Who gave himself up for us to redeem us. How did he redeem us? He, he redeemed us on the cross. Look at the first part of that verse, though. I'm not asking my question well. Okay. Who did what? Okay. He okay. gave himself up for us to redeem us. He didn't just buy us back. What was the price to buy us back? It, it was the cross. It was his. This is, this is what they mean when they say substitutionary atonement. He didn't just make things right. He didn't just redeem us. He didn't just take care of sin and buy us back. He did that by giving himself. He, he was the substitute. So he gave himself up for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own eager to do what is good. Uh, the word eager here literally means is the word for zealous. So being passionate about doing what's right. But by the way, that, that uh, phrase back in verse 13 where he says, uh, Jesus is God. Somebody sent me a link today. In fact, it was Jeff. I just know Jeff. Yes, sir. Whatever. whatever. You guys know Jeff. You may not know him by the name. He sent me a link of a... Uh, uh, I always get it goofed up. Is it Iman or Iman? What, what do you call the leader of a mosque? Iman. Okay. One of those guys. <laughs> One of those Muslim guys who, a Muslim preacher, right? And he said, it, it was a short video clip where he's kind of talking about himself, and he said somebody asked him a question about Jesus in the mosque one day when he was teaching. And so he went back because of that one question and reread the entire Quran, oh. which I, I didn't realize this. He said, by the way, there are 6,666 words in the Quran. And I'm like, ooh. <laughs> <laughs> <Sorry. Yeah. laughs> anyway, that's easy to remember. He, he went back and read that, and he said the first thing that hit him when thinking about Jesus is that Jesus is mentioned more frequently than Muhammad is in the Quran. Did you see this video, too? This is really neat. He was talking about how Jesus is, and, and that it says 10 things about Jesus. And some of them are a little squirrely. A lot of them are pretty good. One of the things he says is this, Jesus is the word of God. He says that in the Quran. Yeah. Well, he, he lists, mentions the other things and he just really got him thinking. He went back to his university professor. He was trained for 10 years to be the mosque preacher. Just <laughs> anyway, to, to be in this leadership position. He went back to the, his professor and he said, uh, how did God create the world? How did God create the world? And his professor said, God spoke the world huh. into existence. He said, okay, well then, is the word of God the creator, or is it part of the creation? And his teacher said, it's the creator. And so he said, you know what? If I'm a good Muslim, I have to be a Christian. Here's Whoa! This, this guy said, yeah. Well, get the knife out. Get the knife out. <laughs> yeah. You wow. can bet. <laughs> I know nothing else about this guy. I can just, just his, imagine I just that didn't go over. So watch well. the video, uh, and yeah, I'm sure he's on the wanted list somewhere. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. But I, his his reasoning was not from scripture. His reasoning was from the Quran. Wow. And he was going through there, but it was just on statements made even in the Quran, which I'm quite confident they didn't mean to make these statements. But they made statements that were some of them were correct. And if you look at these correct statements, you're going to end up in a place where. Jesus, and that's what he was trying to wrestle with. How do I explain Jesus? If you look at the life of Jesus and what everybody knows about Jesus, you, you can't say he's a normal man. And the point he was making is I can't say he's a prophet like Muhammad either. He says that's the number one answer that they always give is he's a prophet like Muhammad. But he decided, no, I'm not going to say that. I'm going to go back and reread the Quran to come to this conclusion. Uh, I found it interesting and very encouraging. 
that things like that still happen. Seems like a lot of present day Muslims, like a lot of present day Christians, have really read the whole book. Yeah, yeah. Wasn't that encouraging? One of the things I thought was so encouraging about your presentation is uh, the greatest amount of evangelism that's taken place with the Muslim world has happened in the last two decades. So um, there's, I, I, I think that's fantastic. Okay, okay. Um, where did I leave off? Verse 15. These men. Uh, no, these then, sorry, not these then. <laughs> these then are the things that you should teach. By the way, that's why I started with verse 1. He's still talking about the imperatives. These things are, are the things that have to happen. Everybody has to know about um, the way God wants us to live as his people. You have to teach these things. And encourage. So you don't just teach. You parakaleo. Can I say that again? Because every time I say it, maybe... It'll sink in a little bit more. What does parakaleo mean? Come alongside of. Yeah, come alongside of with strength and? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> it's, it's the balance of being there, the supportive. Uh, I'm not just yelling at you. I'm, I'm going through life with you to strengthen you. But I'm not just there for you. I'm also going to tell you the truth. So, so it's that balance. So you teach, you encourage, and rebuke. What is your word for review? Is that reprove? Reprove. Okay. This has more of a negative connotation. Well, who's he talking to? You're just talking to somebody and it's got a, the role of teaching. Um, we do need to encourage people. We need to be positive. But every now and then, you, there's just no way around it. You've got to say some things are wrong. Um, uh, so, so there has to be some <coughs> rebuking with all authority. Um, by the way, where does our authority come from? Jesus. If we tell somebody else, hey, that's not right, this is right, what gives us the right to say that's not right, this is right? The Word, the word of God's our authority. Well, one of the things that has always helped me, and I think, I just think it's a general principle here. If we're careful, if we just say what the Bible says, you never have to say, well, you know, I'm against you. You, you never have to do that. All you, all you ever have to do is, let's just see what God says. And sometimes, you know, God's pretty graphic. He's pretty black and white about stuff. And so, well, always pointing to our source of authority, I think, is, is wise <coughs> and helpful. Okay. Do not let anyone despise you. What does, this, what does this sound like? What did Paul tell Timothy? Oh, yeah. Don't let anyone look down on you because you're Yeah, despise your youth or look down on you because you're young. And he gives more of a general statement here to Titus. Let, let no one, let no one, by the way, this word for despise means to uh, make light, little, not as important. Okay, can I, I'm going to give you a frank one. Just, just a personal experience I've had more times than I care to remember. But uh, I apologize because this is just from my point of view. And I'm, I'm sure you've got better illustrations here. One of the things that has discouraged me, there's a lot of things so encourage me. They really do. But one of the things that's been discouraging to me through the years is, is the opportunities I've had to work with the youth. Really, really enjoy working with youth. And a lot of times families, I don't want to say a lot of times, sometimes families are all on board. Yeah, I want my kid in every youth program. I want my kid involved in all this stuff until... Their kid gets so involved, he decides he wants to go to Bible college. <laughs> and then, unfortunately, I've heard a lot of good Christian there every Sunday families say, oh, I can't let my kid go to Bible college. What a waste. <laughs> they they got to make something out of their life. <laughs> you know what that is? That's belittling and despising the truth. You're just treating it as, oh, yeah, this is nice. But when it really comes to how about my kid and what he's going to do with his life, you know, I can't let it happen there. <coughs> that's what you really believe. You, you, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay, I, I didn't mean to say that in such a negative way. But, but, but those things come out every now and then. Um, you know what? Um, I, that's one of, the, one of the many reasons I'm so thankful for the MITRE program here because uh, we can be a Christian in oh so many different places. And, and we need Christian doctors, we need Christian plumbers, we need Christians all over the place. But I am thrilled that uh, we have young people who want to just be 
full time in some form of ministry, missionary, something like that. I, 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 I'm, I'm beyond excited because that, that's uh, giving it the attention that it deserved. Okay, uh, chapter three, remind, remind, uh, by the way, my translation says remind the people. It, it's not the word for people. It, it's remind them. Remind them. Okay, when you say remind the people, that, that sounds more generic, like just talk to people like this. And he hasn't left the subject he's just been talking about. What's he been talking about? We went from elders to older men, to older women, younger women, younger men, in the general way that Christians are supposed to leave, even slaves, even those kind of conditions. So he's still talking about the church people. He says, remind them. That we haven't gone on to something else, okay? Re remind them to be subject to rulers and authorities. To be obedient. To be ready to do whatever is good. And, and just, just one more reminder. I, I know that some of the letters are written a little bit earlier, a little bit later. But the Roman Empire is in control. And throughout the New Testament period, it went from bad situations to worse situations. But as far as politically things being good, it was never good. I mean, it was favorable as far as getting the message out, but as far as uh, promoting Christianity, it was never good. But insofar as, as we are supposed to be the kind of people who are good employees, we're all supposed to be, so, so supposed to be good citizens. Good citizens. E even under, by, by the way, it doesn't mean we shouldn't try our best to vote the right kind of people in, you know, uh, stuff like that. But whoever gets in, we, we need to... We need to put the gospel first and have a good reputation, even as citizens. To slander no one, it says in verse 2. To be peaceable. By the way, this is, this is not the word for peace. Does your translation say peaceable? Uncontentious. What does yours say? Uncontentious. Okay, that's much better. Because what it literally means is don't quarrel. Don't quarrel. Uh, so why not translate it? Don't quarrel. It, if 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 he wants to say peace, there's a word for peace. Irene. He doesn't use that word. So anyway, he says, don't quarrel. Be considerate. Always be gentle towards everyone. At one time, we too, were, I love this. One of the things that helps us live the way we're supposed to live with other people is remember, we used to be that way. <laughs> Aren't you glad that there were good Christian people that came into your life? Aren't you glad that you have that in? So please remember that when dealing with the... Uh, People that maybe uh, push your limits sometimes. We were remember at one time that we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, enslaved to all kinds of passions and pleasures. We were slaved to our appetites. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of here it is again, our of God our Savior. He doesn't specifically mention Jesus, but it's the same God and Savior Jesus Christ back up in verse 13. Love of God our Savior appeared. He saved us not because of righteous things we had done. Means we didn't earn it, right? We're good enough. Not because of righteous things we've done, but because of His mercy. Here it is. He saved us through the... What does your translation say? Mine says washing. Washing. Okay. Regeneration. Okay. This is, this is the same word used throughout the Greek translation of the Old Testament. What was the Greek translation of the Old Testament? Septuagint. Septuagint. The Greek translation of the Old Testament, when they talked about the labor, what was the labor? Big pool water. Yeah, big bathtub. Big, big pool of water out in front. What was the, in front of the tabernacle and in front of the temple. What was the purpose of the labor? The priest had to bathe. They had to be clean. They had to bathe before they could serve in the temple. Right? So before coming into the presence of God, there had to be the washing. He uses the same word for that. It, 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 it literally means that, uh, well, let's just stick with the word washing. It says through washing of. Okay, this is not the preposition of. It, does anybody else have a different preposition here? The washing is the, is the word dia. What, you guys remember what dia means? Through. through. Okay, picture... Picture the arrow going through the apple. The, the idea of this preposition is this is how it's, this is what gets you there. Okay, uh, I, I'm sorry. I, I really do think some translators are biased and they use more broad terms sometimes because they're trying to avoid something 
that this verse clearly says. What does it clearly say? It says there's a washing that gets you where? To rebirth and renewal. Look, 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 look. Instead of let me get bogged down, let me read it again. He saved us through the washing through which, that's, that's literally what the preposition means, there is a rebirth and a renewal by the Holy Spirit whom He poured out on us uh, generously through Jesus Christ our Savior. So where do we start the new life? He, he just said it's at that washing. We start this brand new life at the washing. There's a rebirth. And there's a renewing process that starts. And that renewing process is the work of the Holy Spirit. Doesn't that sound like justification and sanctification? It is. <laughs> it is justification and sanctification. What is this washing where all this happens? Thank you. Verse 6. <laughs> I already read verse 6. Verse 7. So that having been justified, what happened when all this took place? I looked at that white clock and I'm like, out of time already? <laughs> okay, I'm looking at that. <laughs> okay. What what happened here? We were we got the we got the new birth, and there's this renewing process that starts with the Holy Spirit's working in our life, that sanctification. He's still talking about it. He says, so that having been justified, what does the word justified mean? Made right with. That washing made us right with. It, it not only gave us new birth, it not only started the Holy Spirit's working in our life, that's what made us right by His grace. That we might become heirs having the hope of eternal life. Doesn't, doesn't that sound like Galatians 3, 27, 20, 29? He says, as many of us have been baptized in Christ, have clothed Christ, doesn't make you, been clothed with Christ, doesn't make any difference if you're a man or woman, slave or free, Jew or Gentile. You are Abraham's descendants, heirs, According to the promise. Same thing he says here. The promises. We get, we get the results of that. We are the inheritors. Inheritors of what? Eternal life, he says. Verse 8. This, this, what he's just got through talking about. This all this stuff that happens at our baptism. God's saving us. This is a trustworthy saving, saying. And I want you to stress these things. <laughs> Hey, I take that to mean that preachers shouldn't shy away from talking about baptism. <clears throat> so the next time you think I'm talking too much about that. <laughs> <laughs> <And you can't laughs> <wrong. laughs> Alright, I want you to stress these things so that those who have trusted in God may be careful to devote themselves to doing what is good. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. It's not just that we started a new life and there was a new birth. There's also a renewal. When we start a new life, that doesn't just mean, okay, everything's done. It's a new life. There's a renewal. There's a growing thing, growing process that has to take place. And so we've got to devote ourselves to doing what the Holy Spirit wants us to do, listening to the Word of the Spirit, living the kind of life we should live. These things are excellent and profitable for everyone. But avoid foolish controversies, genealogies, arguments, and quarrels about the law. Because these are unprofitable and useless. By the way, did you notice he did not say genealogies in the Scripture are arguments about uh, the Old Testament law. He's talking about general things. In fact, he's going to use a word here in a minute. Yeah, it, it, I'll point it out to you in just a minute. Where it really does emphasize things that are matters of opinion, not things that God has talked about. Which, by the way, I know I'm very opinionated. I'm just going to throw out another opinion here. But just trying to label it appropriately, okay? But it, but it just seems to me, uh, I, I know there are some good books out there worth reading. I know that. But when we start reading something other than the Bible and make something other than the Bible the source of a Bible study, isn't that, isn't that opening the door for this very thing that he's talking about here? Um, I'm, I'm just so thankful that we do our Bible studies with the Bible. It just makes sense. It, it, after he talks about these things are foolish, don't, don't focus on these. Here's what he says in verse 10. Born a divisive person. Okay, what I'm interested in yours. What is the word divisive? How is it translated? Factious. Factious, divisive. Okay, this, this is hard to translate. Why is it hard to translate? This is the only time this word occurs in the Bible. 
most of the time, it's easy to figure out what a word means because you look up every place it's used. Ooh, it's only used once. <laughs> like, oh boy. Well, you have to go to the background of the word. What does the background of the word mean? The background of the word means one's own opinion. Really? Yes, it does. It says. So you're, you're getting off of something that officially God has said, and you're just talking about issues of opinion. And he says, uh, self-chosen opinion, literally. He says, warn that person who's, who's just focused on their particular opinion about something that God hasn't talked about. He says, warn that divisive person, that kind of a person, and then warn them a second time, assuming that they don't change. After that, have nothing to do with them. Whoa, it's an important principle. Yeah. Well, and I think of things like these doctrines that have come out about how you don't need to be baptized, how you're always saved no matter what. You know, and I just I tend to gravitate towards those things, you know. Because I know we can get into talk about things that probably would seem a bit trivial but aren't necessarily wrong. I just, right. You know. Right. You, you know, and th there's a lot of those things, uh, I, I really do think we need to point out the scripture so the scripture talks about them a lot. But sometimes there are things that people get so caught up in that the Bible really doesn't talk about. The Bible tells us very little about angels, for example. But people love to. <laughs> I'm sorry if you're one of the people who just love to. <laughs> but people just love to talk about all the different classifications. And, well, you know, how do we know there's different classifications of angels? All I know is that there's seraphim, there's cherubim, there's uh, guardian <coughs> angels, the Bible mentions. There are some mentioned in the Bible, but if you want the different classifications of angels and how that all works out, you have to go to Jewish history to get a lot of that. Mm -hmm. And some Jewish teaching. And it just seems to me, hey, if God didn't want to, if God's not talking about it, why are we spending so much time talking about it? And, and it's like, well, that's not the only thing that's, that's quite popular. All you have to do is uh, go to a Christian bookstore and see <laughs> what a lot of the topics are. You know, a lot of them are biblical things. They are all over that. But a lot of things are on the demonic world. It's another one. Hey, does the Bible talk about demons? Yes. But you know what? It doesn't talk a whole lot about demons. But there are books and books written about stuff like that. And, and it, it's easy to get sidetracked. And isn't it interesting on those very subjects, sometimes people take such strong stands. And he says, you warn people like that. You warn them a second time. But after that, have nothing to do with them. What's the principle here? Stay what was the principle? Stuff. Say what? Stay away from man-made stuff. Stay away from man-made stuff. Okay, I'll, I'll put a check mark by that. I totally agree with that. Because the Bible emphasizes that a bunch. Uh, in fact, Jesus in Mark, the seventh chapter, you, uh, uh, your whole worship of God is vain when you do stuff like that. Um, also seems to me to be the same point we were making about slavery. The same point we were making about slavery, insofar as, it, you know what? It's easy to get sidetracked on things. Some things are really important, and some people will just suck you in. I, I hope that expression doesn't bother you. I, I can't think of another way to say it. They, they just draw you in and constantly want to talk about stuff that, you know what? If you talk about that stuff all the time, you're not going to have time to do what we're supposed to be doing. So, um, yeah, are, are, we, are we supposed to correct people? When, when things, you bet we are. We're supposed to be patient? You bet. Correct them again? You bet. But you know what? If they keep on doing the same stuff, we need to take a deep breath. And <laughs> um, I, I, By the way, he's talking to an evangelist here, and I really do think he's talking about uh, have nothing to do with them. There are some people that will drag down the whole church. And if they're constantly stirring things up and dividing things, and they've been warned that they won't do anything about it, I think there, I think there is a place in the time to say to some people, hey, you know what? Um, you're not going the same direction we're going. We're on mission here to make disciples, just like Jesus, and you're preventing that. And sometimes we have to uh, church discipline. Yes. I know, like in some, in like one church discipline passage, I think it says like treat him as an unbeliever. Yes, it does. Um, that's uh, Matthew 18, isn't it? Yeah. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I just, uh, every time somebody mentions that, I, I want to try to remember. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, this one here says have nothing to do with them, and so like you mentioned before, treat them as an unbeliever is like, well, 
you don't just disregard them like forever. You, you're, you're trying to evangelize again, kind of like that. So what do you think? How should we take this? Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, I really do think he's talking about uh, evangelists, elders, church leadership. When you look at the congregation and you've got somebody in the congregation and they're causing trouble, you address it. Mm -hmm. They keep causing trouble, you, you address it again. They keep causing trouble. You know what? You're not making disciples. You're not doing what you're supposed to do. At some point in time, I really do think the leadership has to step in and say, please find another church. Please go somewhere else. That you're, you, you know what? you got to cut off ties here. Um, the purpose in 1 Corinthians chapter 5 of handing somebody over to Satan is so that they will miss the fellowship and come back. And hopefully, even in a case like this, uh, somebody will realize, okay, I, you know, them cutting me off, kicking me out, disfellowshipping me, um, maybe I do need to take a hard look at what I was doing. I wasn't helping the church grow. Yeah. Yeah. The treat them like an unbeliever is Matthew chapter 18 where it's talking about when somebody sins against you mm. and you approach them, then you take a witness with you and then you bring it to... The church. Mm -hmm. In fact, it uses the word church there. Mm -hmm. And each time, if, if they don't repent, you go to the next step. Mm -hmm. If they don't repent when it's brought before the, the church, then you treat them as an unbeliever. Yeah. Okay. Um, what verse were we on? 12. Yeah, thank you. Oh, no, verse 11. I missed 11. Um, verse 11 is that you may be sure that such people are warped. I always like that word. This word for warped is in the perfect tense. Perfect tense means something happened, something altered, and it's remained altered from that point on. In other words, this is a perfect party. This is a perfect description of somebody who got off track and they stay off track. You know, they, they uh, something. You can you can be sure that a person's warped and sinful. By the way, the word sinful is in the per in the present tense. They keep on sinning by perpetuating. Uh, their false teaching, and their self-condemned. As soon as, uh, verse 12, as soon as, as I send Artemis and Tychicus to you, do your best to come to me in Nicopolis, because I have decided to winter there. Notice, don't leave until these guys come, right? I'm going to send these guys to you, and then you go. Uh, Artemis is, if, if, if I recall correctly, he's only mentioned here, but Tychicus is mentioned several places. He's mentioned uh, uh, in uh, Colossians, in in Ephesians, in the book of Acts, in 2 Timothy. He's, he's one of the co-workers of Paul and some of these other guys uh, mentioned several times. Also in verse 13, do everything to help uh, Zenos, the, the lawyer, and Apollos. Does that name ring a bell? If it's the same Apollos, and likely it is, uh, Acts chapter 18, 1 Corinthians, several times he's mentioned it at, to the letter uh, in 1 Corinthians because a lot of people really liked Apollos there and they wanted everybody to know, hey, I'm an Apollos Christian. Oh. Remember that? Uh, some follow Paul, some follow Apollos. He was the gifted speaker that uh, uh, Aquila and Priscilla pulled aside to teach more accurately. Anyway, notice what he says. He says, do everything you can help them on their way and see if they have everything they need. Now, what do we know about Apollos? Apollos, in particular, was a preacher. And he says, when he comes your way, what are you supposed to do? Look at the last part of verse 13. What are you supposed to do? Take care of them, Take care of them and see they have everything they need as they're going along. What does that sound like? Support. Sounds like to me, take up a good offering <laughs> and help send them on their way. Right? It, this sounds like missionary support to me. Um, you were raising your <laughs> All right, verse 14. Uh, our people must learn to devote themselves to doing what is good. Isn't it interesting he says that right after he talks about supporting the missionaries? So if we've got to learn to devote ourselves to doing what is good in order to provide for urgent needs and not live unproductive lives. What are the urgent needs? You get the gospel out there. So uh, uh, supporting things like that instead of Notice, notice, it's interesting to me because it's kind of juxtaposed. It's kind of set one against the other. 
doing good things, supporting somebody who's getting the gospel message out versus wasting your life. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? Living an unproductive life. You want to leave, leave a legacy? You want to leave something behind? You do that by, by supporting somebody who's helping win people to the Lord. It, because what goes beyond this life? It, you might see some people. It, I always love that song, Thank You. It, 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 it's a picture of a song where people are in heaven coming up to you saying, you know what, that money you gave to the missionary, he was able to come to me, and I'm just so glad that you gave. You know, won't, won't that be a neat, neat kind of a picture? It really does happen that way. It says, the alternative is unproductive life. Verse 15, everyone with me uh, sends you greetings. Uh, by the way, I should have mentioned, it's probably, um, when he mentions these guys, Artemis and Tychicus and Zenos and Apollos, they're probably the guys who also brought... Uh, brought the letter, brought the letter um, that's being read here. In fact, that's probably, I should have been more specific on that, that's probably Zenos and Apollos because he's supposed to wait until Artemis and Tychicus get there. Okay, everyone with me sends you greetings. Uh, greet those, uh, okay, everyone with me sends you greetings. Greet those who love us in, in the NIV says, who love us in the faith. What is, what is your saying? Mike says, no, but I crossed it out. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, you know, so many times they don't put the article there when it should be. Mm -hmm. They added an article here when there's no article there. <laughs> so what it literally says is, greet those who love us in faith, not the faith. When you think of the faith, you usually think of a body of belief. Not always. You know, I don't want to be too stringent about this. But when you just use it without the article, you usually think of, trusting belief or loyalty, a commitment. Mm. It's kind of like saying greet those who are, man, the kind of people you can count on. Uh, they're, they're Christians who, you know, right there next to you, parakaleo, grace be to you all, plural, plural. So it's not just written to Titus, it's written to the whole church. They might understand the role of different leadership positions and the responsibilities we've got within the church. I finished four minutes early. <coughs> Right. <laughs> <laughs> Questions, comments? What's next? next, first and second Thessalonians. First and second Thessalonians. <coughs> Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we know what a, what a precious and wonderful thing it is to be part of your family, to have a relationship with you, and to have a future and a home. We know what a wonderful thing it is to be part of your church, your body, your family, your bride. And it's good to be reminded of the importance of the unity that we have within that body, within this fellowship, in the different roles that we play. The very fact that uh, these men are here trying to better equip themselves to be the kind of men you want them to be. God, I'm thankful. And I ask your blessing on them as they try to stand up and take the leadership that uh, this world needs to see. Help us to represent you well. In Jesus' name I pray.